Well, so far, Oregon's defense looks better in 2023, but Shador Sanders, yeah, he's going to give them their biggest test yet so far this season, and it'll serve as a great barometer for the rest of the year. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review wherever you listen to or watch this show. We're coming up on 3500 on YouTube. Can we do it before Saturday? I believe we can. So if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter promo code locked on college for a free water bottle with any purchase. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. And I promise you, you'll love today's show because we got my guy, my guy Max Torres covering the Ducks for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. He's the publisher of Ducks Digest, Ducks Dish Podcast. Many of you know him quite well. Let's hop right into it, Max. I think we have talked a lot about the Ducks defense over the past, oh, 365 days and counting, frankly, dating back to last year. Okay, maybe not quite that many because this is a different unit, but let's call it 200 days. We've spent 200 days talking about this Oregon defense, and I think, though imperfect against Texas Tech, they looked better, have to clean up the penalties, but this is the best quarterback they've faced in 2023, and he's one of the better ones they will face all season, but there are other good ones they'll see in the pack this year as well. Yeah, that shot against uh, Tyler Shuck was kind of that glimpse, I should say, was uh, our first test of how Oregon's defense is going to go up against some of those uh, more highly uh, regarded quarterbacks. And Shador Sanders is certainly that. Dan Lanning was quick to give some uh, praise to Shador Sanders on Monday during his press conference, saying that he uh, is really good at extending the play and using his legs. But what was interesting to me, Spencer, was how he said he he runs to pass as opposed to just running to run. Mm-hmm. Um, paraphrasing a little bit, but you get the idea. So Shador Sanders is definitely going to be a very unique challenge for the Ducks. And I think we might have talked about this earlier. I think it's, it's lining up well for Oregon that they had the schedule that they did because they went against, uh, I, I think, I don't know if you would call Tyler Shuck a dual threat quarterback, but certainly a capable runner. So they've been tested in that dimension of their defense. And then they went against kind of a pure air raid type of guy last year, uh, sorry, last week against uh, Braden Shager uh, and Hawaii. So I think this will be a unique test for Oregon. He's certainly super athletic and he's got some great weapons to throw to, even though Travis Hunter is not going to be able to go. Yeah, they're, they're still capable wide receivers. Travis Dunner with or Travis Hunter with the lacerated kidney not expected uh, to play. He's going to be out for a few weeks, but it, it's not as if Shador Sanders has thrown for what is it nine hundred yards or I, I don't even know. No, that was through the first couple of weeks. It was nine hundred yards. He's like second in the country in passing, and, and yeah, he's missing his top target. You don't throw for that many yards in the way in which he has if you only have one guy who you're relying on. Like this is. You know, not Justin Herbert, Dylan Mitchell, circa 2018, where it's like on third and 11, there's only one guy you're going to. Like Shador Sanders has spread the ball around. And that's one of the reasons I think this is such a great test, not just for the players on the Ducks defense, but for the coaching staff, because it is really a quick passing game. There are a lot of short, quick throws like we saw against Portland State. Obviously, this is a much higher caliber opponent. The Buffs come in. Sure as three touchdown underdogs, they were against TCU as well. But I, I think that they are so, so good offensively. Their offensive coordinator, Sean Lewis, I think is really, really good. And he's done an excellent job of scheming an offense that gets the ball out of Shador Sanders' hands quickly and then takes their shots in in, in specific moments. I think it kind of operates like an air raid in that sense. And it's a really, really tough thing to defend because if a lot of the pass attempts are snap it back to him, he makes one read. If it's not there, he goes to a second and he's throwing a curl slant drag tunnel screen or quick go route, whatever. That's a really, really hard thing to defend because you don't give the defensive lineman time to get home. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things that uh, this Oregon defense is going to see from Colorado when Saturday rolls around. And then they also have a, a really talented running back in a, uh, 
Dalen Edwards or D- Dylan, Dylan Edwards. Dylan Edwards. Dylan Edwards. Yeah. Um, good player. Yeah. D- Dylan Edwards out of uh, Kansas. I mean, I, I remember that name circulating last cycle when Oregon was recruiting them, uh, recruiting him before the, the Ducks got Dante Dowdell and, and Jaden Lamar. So I think he's a good example of Colorado. If you look outside of the portal, obviously, I think he's a good example. Edwards is out of the backfield of the caliber of a player that Colorado doesn't typically have. And um, even though the Buffs haven't been a a very good running team so far, he's definitely a guy that I think the Ducks are going to have to key in on defensively when they kind of look at what the Buffs are going to show them. So Shadour Sanders is obviously where this whole thing starts. He's the the guy that makes that engine run. And he was uh, at the forefront of that comeback over Colorado State. Just, you know, as long as he's that kind of guy, I've seen a couple of them even out here at the high school level, Darius Curry at Long Beach Poly where Dylan Williams is at, he's the kind of guy, Spencer, that as long as he's under center running your offense, I think you got a shot in every game. And I'm sure that Dion feels the same way. So he's a guy I'm really excited to see on Saturday. And then even more so excited to see how Oregon's defense responds because like we're kind of both saying here, that's another big test. And how they do in that test, I think will go a long way in determining what this defense is ultimately going to be able to do this season, going against guys like Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, maybe Cam Rising, depending on his health when they when that matchup comes around. So really, really excited for this one. Yeah, I, I think Joel Clapp made a good point. I heard him say about Shador Sanders. He was talking about the clutch factor that he's had this year. And Shador Sanders has been superb in the fourth quarter. Like the numbers bear that out. He's been really, really good. And what Clatt said is, look, if you get to the fourth quarter and it's a one possession game, you're going to have a chance because of the way Shador's played in the fourth quarter. And I think so far it's played out that way. I think Oregon is a better team than anyone Colorado has played to this point. I think Colorado is also probably the best team that Oregon has played uh, to this point. Texas Tech would probably be able to go back and forth with Colorado, but I mean, it, 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 we'll see how the season plays out. But but regardless, I think it's the biggest, uh, most high-profile matchup for the Ducks uh, so far, for sure. Like, we know the Buffs can get a lot of eyeballs. Um, there, there's no no doubt about that. Colorado has had, like, over 8 million people watching every single uh, game that they've played this season, including Colorado State, which was, like, the most, uh, most watched ESPN late-night game ever which usually get between like one and three million. They had like nine. Like it, it's it, it's crazy. It, it, it's crazy what they're doing in in that sense. But just wrapping up on Shadour, the other reason that I think this is a test for the Ducks is that's an NFL quarterback on the other side who's been really, really impressive to this point. And the offensive line has not been a strength. If the Ducks defensive line is you know playing up to their capabilities from what we've seen this year, Shadour Sanders should be sacked multiple times on Saturday. I definitely think it's a possibility, Spencer, but I also think back to that Hawaii game. I remember I was writing my five question story ahead of that game. And my first question was, can Jordan Birch dominate? And he did get his first sack with the Ducks last week, but the Ducks only sacked uh, Braden Shager twice. And I think Hawaii statistically had literally one of the worst offensive lines in the country. So I feel like the defensive line might have underdelivered a little bit, might be underdelivering a little bit so far. I don't know if um, I fu- I don't know if I fully agree with that because against Hawaii, I think you had a lot of the quick passing game and you held them under 150 yards. So it's not like he had time to set his feet and take shots down the field. They had a couple of sacks, pressure led to an interception. I, I thought they looked like they controlled the line of scrimmage pretty well defensively. I, I was also going to add that Popo Amavai. Uh, had had some uh, had a nice I think that was a sack actually that yeah he had a sack so yeah he's showing up and then Tatum Tuioti had a a TFL as well so I I wasn't uh, quite finished making that comment but (laughs) no I I, no you're good Uh, (laughs) but I I totally see the point I mean I think anytime you're being critical or you kind of have to look at the full picture and and that's why it's nice to to always have you know you on my show and vice versa so we can kind of go back and and uh, you know have some some constructive conversations so I think that Oregon's defensive line is absolutely going to play a huge role here because if they can get home, it's going to make uh, Shador Sanders' job a whole lot harder. And and I think that they're they're showing up early, but you just want to see maybe some more of that consistency because even if the plays don't develop necessarily for Shador Sanders, he's going to extend them because we know he's capable of doing that incredibly mobile in the pocket and outside the pocket. So I think that uh, that'll still create some more opportunities. You just got to keep him contained and not let anything get too crazy.
Yeah, and, and that brings to mind another thing the defensive line has to consider. They won't be thinking about bird dog shorts, but you definitely should be because they look good, they feel good, and you can bring them literally anywhere that you want to go. You could wear them to bed, you could wear them in the pool or going to a lake, going wakeboarding, skiing, what, like literally whatever you want to do, bird dog shorts are there. Their stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. And they're not made of a stiff, restricting cotton like regular shorts. They've got that slim fit, and the versatility is perhaps the best part of it. Bird Dog uses anti stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. And as I said, functional for any occasion. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter promo code locked on college at checkout for a free Bird Dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. We promise you. And by we, I mean myself. The Locked On Network, and I'm going to include Max in that discussion as as well. My guy is, uh, he doesn't have to endorse them. You got to send would. me some, bro. I'm always on the show. Come on. <laughs> you know, you make a good point. You make a good I'm point. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The, 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 the argument is clear. I'm going to see what we can do. I I know people. I got, I got contacts. Okay, anyway. So back to the defensive line. One thing that you, you've talked about and are completely right on is that Shador Sanders runs to extend the play. You know, it's a Mahomes-like quality. Patrick Mahomes runs when he has to, but mostly he breaks the pocket so that he can go off and run. And Oregon definitely had their moments last year where mobile quarterbacks like that gave them fits. Now, I thought they did much better in the Holiday Bowl against Drake May. In the second half, there were moments where May wanted to break contain, and the rushing lanes were disciplined. They won their individual battles, and they were able to keep him relatively bottled up North Carolina didn't score a touchdown in in the second half of that game that's what we have to see here is you have to force Shador Sanders to make plays from the pocket because if he extends I mean it just becomes such a difficult ask of the secondary to cover for that long against good Colorado receivers not the best in the conference without Travis Hunter far from it but still capable for sure and it's just impossible no matter who you're going up against to cover for six seven eight seconds so I think pressure is going to be important and, and pressure with discipline is going to be important because if you if you have moments like Cam Ward last year against Washington State, who was running all around the field, we weren't able to get him on the ground like Cam Ward did in Pullman last year, Shador Sanders will be able to make plays. I like what you said about pressure with discipline because I think we saw an example of that even last week when Jordan Birch got his sack, he overpenetrated, he overpursued, he went past the quarterback and then he had to turn around to, to get the guy and he still got him, which is what matters but it's a perfect example of, to your point, or even like what we saw with Mateo Uyunglele uh, against Texas Tech. He should have had the sack on Tyler Shuck, but he was able to to squeeze out of his uh, his grip. So you got to win your one on one and win at the line of scrimmage and get that first step, the first jump. But it's so much more than that if you want to ultimately come away with a sack. And then I think another way you could look at this, Spencer, is don't even Oregon's defensive line shouldn't get too focused on the sack. If you can just pursue him you know, get hits on him, rattle him. And when he's extending these plays, just, you know, stay in front of him and make it difficult. I think that that could go a long way and just uh, making it a harder day for him against this passing defense, which is looking more promising with, with guys like Jalil Florence kind of taking steps and making strides each week. I think he's been one of the, the greatest stories so far. Kyrie Jackson has two interceptions in two straight games uh, or Two interceptions in as many games might be a better way to say that. So he's doing a great job of being in the right place at the right time, kind of working to redeem himself after that pass interference call against Texas Tech. So I think things are definitely going in the right way, the right direction, and uh, Oregon should be ready for the challenge. Yeah, and I, I think the secondary has got such tremendous depth because, you know, TriQuest Bridges was Oregon's highest graded cornerback outside of Christian Gonzalez last year, and he's been, you know, moved down the depth chart because they like Kyrie Jackson and Jaleel Florence as the top two guys, and Quez and Dante Manning are kind of the next two corners on the list. They're still playing. They're still important players on the defense, but certainly they're not seeing the field as much as they did a year ago. And then at the nickel spot, you know, uh, Nico Reed, uh, who's playing against his old team uh, this week, and Tysheem Johnson have been kind of your primary guys there. There's been a little bit of Cole Martin, um, but I think Martin is more of a 2024 guy. And I get excited just thinking about just like really quick, Max, 2024 secondary for the Ducks. I, I, I see a couple of foundational pieces in Cole Martin and Jaleel Florence and 
you throw in like a Dalen Austin who's impressed in the limited time that that he's seen. I, I'm I'm all about 2023. Don't get me wrong, but I just like have these thoughts from time to time of like, phew, Dude, man, how Mateo do you think on I'm still covering recruiting. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm ready for these guys to get on the field right yeah, now, but yeah. it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I I I think there's a lot a lot of promise on the back end going forward, which we're going to need because you're going to lose Brian Addison, you're going to lose Steve Stevens, you're going to lose Evan Williams, Tyshim Johnson. I think might be able to have another year. We'll we'll, we'll see, but. Speaking of the defense and guys we haven't seen yet, uh, we, we got an update recently on on Justin Jacobs, Nishat Strother as well, the offensive lineman who transferred from East Carolina at the guard position who came in. Curious to see if we are, are, are going to see him, but Jacobs is the the injury name I've been most waiting to to see if he's going to be able to play this week. So what, what have you heard on that front? Yeah, so as far as those two guys, uh, Dan Lanning didn't say a whole lot about them on Monday night. Shocker. He was he Shocker. was asked about their progression, and <laughs> and uh, it was interesting because it wasn't a, a close-ended question, a yes or no, but he just said, uh, good, that they're progressing good <laughs> or well. But, uh, you know, uh, Eric Scopel, my guy over at Duck Territory, fellow Zag, does a great job, and uh, he was able to go to practice on Tuesday and said that both Struther and Jacobs were in cleats. I'm reading this off of DuckTerritory.com, so I'm not stealing any of this. Uh, were in cleats and worked with their position groups during non-contact drills before stepping aside during the lone full contact period media took in. So they're progressing in the right way. Um, you know, I remember from my time in Eugene that you don't always get to see a whole lot, but at practice, but that is definitely a notable update. I would say that the Ducks probably need Jacobs more than Struther at this point, um, but it seems like those guys are turning in the right direction, at least as of right now. Going to have to see what else we get on Wednesday, which will be our uh, our last day for updates from landing players and uh, people that go to practice. Yeah, we're, we're, we're recording the show on Tuesday, and look, when it comes to injuries, we, we know not to expect a lot from Dan Lanning at this point. If we thought we would get anything else, then we would be the fools. And we, we just, you know, insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. And we know that Lanning is not going to give a lot. He's not obligated to. I don't think he has to one way or the other. Would it be nice? Yeah, sure. But we'll end up seeing on Saturday whether or not they take the field. I'm with you that Jacobs would be probably a bigger impact guy compared to Strother. And I, I think that Marcus Harper's probably got the left guard spot nailed down. I, I am curious, though, just because of, you know, the experience and talent that uh, that he had coming in this offseason, where Junior Angelau is on the depth chart. Is Have he you not? Seen him? I don't I mean, he played I, a little I'm against Portland State. But, I mean, that that speaks also to the play of Iapani Laulu because he, yeah, he's been the does. guy who's been getting, you know, thrown in there a little bit at right guard, I want to say. Yep. Um, and you got to think of who's in front of him, a veteran, Stephen Jones, probably the most experienced guy on this entire roster. Not probably so, he I, is. No, pr not probably yeah. he is. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's necessarily, uh, they just want to give, uh, Stephen Jones a spell or if Iapani is just the, the better guy in those situations, but for him to get the playing time that he's gotten, particularly against Texas tech, the one really competitive game Oregon's played so far. I think that speaks volumes to, to where he's at. And uh, I think it's kind of one of the more, I don't know if unexpected is the right word because he was getting some buzz in fall camp, but one of the more exciting or promising storylines because we, we saw it with uh, Josh Connerly last year and then maybe to a lesser degree with Panay Sewell in, in 2018. But just these guys getting into the rotation and staking claims to significant spots, I mean, you're not doing that because you have to. Uh, or, you know, just to get him out there, you're doing it because they're playing at such a high level that you can't keep them off the field. Yeah. And I, I think that, uh, you know, Sewell was not just, you know, a role player. He was the starting left tackle as a true as a freshman. freshman. Connerly last year had a role in meaningful snaps in the 14J package as a true freshman. It's not uncommon for a true freshman to play, but along the offensive line, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. It, it is it is really, really tough. And I think telling as, as to what Poncho has showed this coaching staff that, you know, he he appears to have leapfrogged, you know, a junior Angolau or a Davey Uli, uh, who is a four-star recruit himself coming out of uh, high school in the Washington area, uh, who has also played a, a little bit. And I think, you know, Uli's done a really, really, really solid job when, when he's gotten his opportunities. But Poncho's not just getting in when, you know, the game is out of hand. He's, he's in there as one of the rotational offensive linemen. I mean, it, it's not 
is a little different than receivers and tight ends in terms of how often you sub guys in. You do it more frequently at the skill position spots, but rarely is there a day where you play just five offensive linemen in in in, in a football game like that is not like guys get dinged up. Maybe guys do need a spell. Someone might not be performing well enough. You need to get him in there. So I, I think what he's done uh, to crack the starting five is is really, really good. He could be one of the five top antibiotic options in the Jace case. How was that for a medical ad read transition right there? So the Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. And all it takes to get a Jace case is to fill out the simple online form. And in some cases, jump on a quick call with one of their board certified physicians. You don't want to be caught unprepared in today's world. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. So if you're having a moment of pain, you don't want to go to the doctor's office, you know how long the wait times are going to be, Jay's case is what you need. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off using my code Locked On at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Use that code Locked On to get an additional $20 off for your Jace case today. All right, let's talk a little uh, a little recruit. Unless you got any final thoughts, kind of on the, the offensive line and the matchups that that will that we'll see against uh, against the Buffs this this weekend. No, let's get into the Cruton. I'm here for it. All right, yeah, Max is always down to talk about the the Cruton. I can just tell for those listening on podcasts, Max's eyes light up when a guy who he covered in high school starts seeing the field. Oh yeah, in, a, in an impactful way, not just playing in garbage time or getting an opportunity here and there. You, you should see the way his eyes light up. It is like a six-year-old on Christmas morning. He is so very excited. So recruiting never stops. We know that, and Oregon knows that. It looks like Brandon Baker's going elsewhere, the number one offensive tackle. Oregon was once upon a time in a good position, but these things, as we all know, are very fluid, and they change. And Baker's recruitment has gone on for a while. It looks like he's going to head off to Texas. Oregon's still looking for their first five-star in 2024. Aiden Breland is probably the most likely option there. But are there any names that you're looking for, you know, for this particular weekend, Max, uh, that, that might be on campus or, you know, Oregon might be able to get on their radar a little bit more? Because this is going to be, as I mentioned earlier, a highly viewed, highly consumed, much discussed football game and if Oregon wins I don't think that does anything but help uh their their recruiting efforts in 2024 yeah so for Baker that is a guy that I uh changed my recruiting prediction from Oregon to Texas on uh last week um I think that barring any last minute changes at the 11th hour he's probably gonna I'm feeling still feeling good about that prediction uh went to Nebraska this past weekend for an official and he's committed on Sunday the 24th so we'll see if anything happens last minute but I'm feeling good about that pick for right now as for guys that are expected on campus this weekend, I'm still kind of doing my homework and, and uh, trying to put a list together. But I got a couple names for you and the uh, listeners, Spencer. Uh, first, a uh, couple of commits are going to be returning to Eugene for a visit. I believe their first visit since committing to the Ducks. That's Southern California linebackers Dylan Williams out of Long Beach Poly and Kamar Matuti out of Los Alamitos High School. So always good to have your commits back on campus. Those are, in many instances, your best recruiters that can do peer recruiting and just relate to these recruits on obviously a much different level than coaches can because they're going through that experience. They know what it's like. They can talk about why they committed to Oregon and why that was the best fit. But the biggest name right now that we know of that's supposed to be in Eugene is uh, 2024 four-star edge rusher Solomon Williams out of Carrollwood Day School in Tampa, Florida. He has Oregon in his top five, along with Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, and Texas A&M. Oh, I really thought I could remember all of that off the top of my head. Um, But I'm going to have to uh, fact check that on the fly. But he's expected to be on campus, and I think he is instantly the uh, most important visitor as of right now. By the time this comes out, we might have more names that we know are coming. Guys tend to announce their visit intentions uh, over social media. Um, okay, I got the updated list, so bear with me here. Solomon Williams, final five. You got Alabama, Texas, Texas A&M, Clemson, and Oregon. So, I mean, 
those are some of the biggest names on the recruiting trail or biggest recruiting powers. Texas is on fire right now uh, after they uh, land, they beat Alabama on the road in Tuscaloosa. So should be a very uh, important weekend for the Ducks. Certainly a game that's going to attract a lot of eyeballs, and I would expect that they would get a lot more big names coming to campus this weekend. Yeah, and I, I think that for the Ducks, who, who, by the way, last I had checked, had risen up to number 11. They've now slipped back to number 12. You know, Brian Smith has come on here and talked about how fluid the recruiting rankings are for 2024 because it's really, really close. Like the difference between Oregon at 12 and Notre Dame at 11 is 0.02, which is basically a wash. So I think if the Ducks certainly, if they're able to land, you know, a Solomon Williams or an Aiden Breland, that I would think, Max, puts them back inside the top 10. And look, there's still signing day, which comes after the season and everything. But I'm talking about this, we're talking about this ahead of the Colorado game because these are the sorts of marquee matchups that, you know, as you alluded to with Texas, Alabama, is it on that level? Maybe not. But gosh, I don't know that it's that far off. I mean, Oregon we know is a big brand, but Colorado is like the brand in in right now. In, in college football right now. And if you go out and beat them, I talked about this on on yesterday's show. You go out and beat them. This is not like going and beating an Arizona State team uh, as a twenty one point favorite or beating Arizona by twenty seven points like they did last year. Beating Cal by twenty plus points. This is beating a team if Oregon's able to win this one big that I think will turn some heads because you know. Whether you're in on the Colorado hype train or not, a lot of people are and see them as a really good program and a really good team at the moment. And that's something that is going to benefit Oregon if they're able to win the football game is you're going to get on people's radar because everybody's going to be watching. Yeah, and Oregon's already on Oregon. Oregon's already on Oregon's radar. Oregon's already <laughs> on a lot of people's radar, uh, but they're kind of um, you know flying low right now, just kind of being quiet. I think that they're working behind the scenes. That's why I have one of those recent episodes on my show uh, with with does Oregon have some tricks up their sleeves on the in the 2024 class? And I think that Breland is a guy that I feel good about as of right now. He's coming off of that unofficial visit to, to Georgia, and as of this recording, hasn't announced a commitment date. I think to me, for my two cents, if he had announced a commitment date fresh off of that visit, that would not be the sign that Oregon was looking for. But so far, that hasn't happened, so we'll have to continue tracking the developments over there. And then I think another guy you have to keep an eye on is Sione Laulea, the number one junior college pro- prospect in the country. He's 6'4", 185 pounds out of College of San Mateo. So he's a guy that Oregon is still very high on, still very wide, much Wide receiver? Corner. Uh, corner. Corner okay. in the 24 class, technically. So um, I think that he's another big name. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if he's going to be taking another trip yet, but it looks like he's probably going to be announcing within the next month or so. Um, so I know that's a guy that Demetrius Martin really wants. You're going up against Miami and USC for him. Max Torres is at mTorres Sports on Twitter, host of the Duck Stitch podcast, covering Oregon for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated, also the editor and publisher of Ducks Digest. Max, my man, it is always a great time. Real quick before you go, you got a game score prediction for this week? I get to save mine until Friday as the host of the show, but I get to put you on the spot as we record this show on Tuesday. Your game score prediction. Oh, geez. I haven't written mine yet. I usually write it on Wednesdays. Uh, But I'm going to go... Uh, I'm going to go Oregon 45, Colorado um, 27. 45, 27. You heard that, it here. That's just off the top of my head. You heard it here first, 45, 27. Thanks, Max. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate my listening. I'll see you all next time. Hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. And until next time, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.